So welcome, 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 our remarkable, brilliant colleague, Elizabeth. We so appreciate your consistent leadership and solidarity. And as always at Setsi, we begin all things by giving thanks to the original stewards of the various lands we're on. We give thanks to all our ancestors, all those who toiled without compassion or compensation. We give thanks to all our elders and community stalwarts whose shoulders we stand on as we build, share, and learn together for our collective liberation and sovereignty. So Elizabeth, can you please introduce yourself to our listeners and viewers and share a bit about your remarkable work? Sure, thank you. And, and I just want to express my gratitude for the invitation for this conversation and the opportunity to, to tell a bit of the story of what Maitri is, is doing. So I work with Maitri. Um, as you said, I'm Elizabeth McIsaac. I'm the president at Maitri. Uh, we are an organization that is focused on advancing the human human rights and in particular social and economic rights as, as it relates to poverty. So we're focused on eliminating poverty and we're doing it through what we believe is uh, another approach which is focusing on realizing and fulfilling people's social and economic rights so that they don't experience poverty. She, she. Your work is truly inspiring and phenomenal. And I love the fact that whenever I go to your website, there's so much work happening. <laughs> that, you know, like, there's so much to unpack on the site. So once again, I just applaud you and your incredible team. I know it's never one person that does everything, but it is all, it's usually one person that holds the vision and pulls people together. So once again, I just applaud your leadership and your consistency. So my next question, what's inspiring you right now? What has you curious or what's keeping you up at nights? Well, I think that every, with everyone, lots is keeping us up at night. Um, but to your point, it, it's, uh, it is many people. Uh, it is a full team that is doing this work. Uh, we're also inspired by our board. So it's an all hands together creating this vision. Um, and I think for me, the inspiration comes from two places as we work on human rights. Um, in the first instance, uh, we have systems in place that are creating poverty. And these systems are public policies and, and regulations and, and laws that are in place that are systematically putting people in a position of vulnerability. And so I get inspired by the opportunity to transform. What happens when we're able to change policies, change regulations, change laws, so that we center people, that we center the dignity of people to live in place uh, with a life of dignity as it relates to their housing, their ability to have food on the table, uh, their ability to have adequate income coming into the family so that they can make things work for their family, for their children and so forth. So changing those systems and the ability to do that, and I believe we can. I think that if we if we're smart about our work, if we provide the right evidence, if we if we work in in constructive relationships with governments, with communities, uh, with with all of those players together, that we can make those changes that will transform. So, I get inspired by transformation of those systems, but I'm really grounded. My inspiration is grounded in the people. And so it's the people that we work with. It's the people whose experience uh, is driving that change. And I, um, I recently, uh, we, we've been supporting a group of young leaders in Malvern uh, through Malvern Family Resource Center. And they're, they're running a leadership program that's bringing 10 young women together to engage on in those systems that are challenging them. So I think they're, you know, they're focusing on, on housing as it relates to their community there, but also schools, schools that may not be including everyone in the community or ensuring that everyone gets the same opportunity to complete and to succeed. And so anyway, these, this, there's this group of young women who are emerging leaders and, and you know, they've got a lot of challenges in front of them that they're working through. And uh, so their life, their work, their dedication, because this isn't a program where you kind of drop in and say, hey, I'm here, you know, let's see what's going on. They're committing six months to really learn about how policy works, learn about how to meet with their government representatives, figure out how to get their message crystal clear so that it lands, so that they can be effective in negotiating the changes that they want to see. And uh, last week we had an event uh, in downtown Toronto and we had, it was, a, it was, 
geared for our Matriot Policy School. It was an alumni event. And so to, to get, you know, people who are off to work and so forth, we schedule it at a, this, you know, ungodly hour. It's at eight o'clock in the morning. Um, and we had a great speaker, uh, a woman whose name is uh, Sarah De Perry, and she was one of Obama's speech writers. So she came up from the States to talk about how do you craft your message? And two of these young women made it from Malvern downtown to get in on that learning. That inspires me because they are making, they are going to make change happen because they're focused, dedicated, and smart. And so that's where I get inspiration because that's where the change is going to come. It's such a small world, and that's such a remarkable story of leadership and civic engagements. I grew up in Malvern, and if I oh, show right? my Malvern soccer picture, um, you'd cry if you knew the amount of young men that are no longer here um, that were in that soccer picture. And one of my first jobs over 20 years ago was at Malvern Family Resource Center, funny enough. And the other thing that's such a small world is, I'm sorry, Sarada Perry, one of my colleagues from the TMU just connected us to interview her this week. So we're actually, I'm connected to her as well because she's doing a fellowship at um, Ladeus right now. So um, That's what you're world. great at, Victor. You're connecting all of us. It's so good. Well, relational infrastructure is how our ecos how ecosystems thrive. You know, you have rivers, right. you have lakes, you have streams. And sometimes we use these terms, ecological terms and sectors, not realizing how important relational infrastructure is. It's, it's, it's a framework for how we can really create reciprocity and create a system where resources are abundant and we don't have a scarcity mindset, you know, because there's great power in, in relationships and stewarding them and cultivating them. So once again, I applaud that work in Malvern. That is, that's, Unbelievable. Congratulations. So, so my next question, what challenges and barriers do you face in your work? And how are you and your colleagues working to overcome some of these challenges and barriers? So that's a great question. And it builds on what you were just saying, Victor. Um, and it's it's about relationships. How do we how do we cultivate relationships? How do we how do we build them? How do we make them strong and and authentic? Um, you know, we we're we're all very busy. We started this conversation earlier and talked about busyness that we're 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 all involved in, but we have to make time for these relationships. And so, you know, as as an organization, we're we do the work of human rights. I, we've got a team of of twelve of us here working on this, but we also make grants to organizations. And 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 so, it's important that we find ways to make those relationships with our partners in community real so that they can feed us, that they can help us understand better, that we're able to, to have a, a, a relationship of that reciprocity that you just talked about, that that ability to, um, you know, understand the power relationship, but also get past that so that we can be partners in finding solutions that work. So building those relationships with people is key. Um, there are times that we're funded. Sometimes we're just sitting at a table because we're part of a network that's trying to make a change happen. So you know, if it's it's around the right to housing, we have networks at the federal level, we have them at the city level, and we sit, you know, shoulder to shoulder with with people who are living with housing precarity, so that we can begin to to really share knowledge, uh, expertise, and figure out how we can work better together and understand how to make the change happen. So, I think that's part of it, and and making sure that we do that. So to that end, we within our very small organization, I have a a director of community investment and engagement because you can't have one without the other. And so I, I think language is important. You know, we, we make sure that, that, that if that, that's how it's crafted, then that's what you're going to do. And that's where we can measure results against. And that's really important. The other, I would say, big challenge uh, that we have faced, and, and we started down this path of a human rights approach to poverty um, almost 10 years ago, and and the challenge, and I and I think this will resonate with you, is that we we don't live in a in a a society where there's a culture of human rights. We talk about it, we have it notionally, we have a human rights code, we have these pieces are in place, but how do we live it? How much of it is it part of our culture? Um, and I think that there's enough happening in our world right now that we can look around and say that it's not. It's not shaping the relationships between people, between communities, in how our systems work and how our expectations and accountability of government works. It's not functioning as a culture of human rights. And so a big part of our task and, and the challenge ahead is to build that up so that it's meaningful. 
um, a, a couple of years ago, COVID's funny, I think it must be four or five years ago now, because that, 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 that sort of gap in our, in our, in our timeline is, is always significant. Um, we did, we did some thinking and we did a paper on what a human rights city would look like. And I remember taking that, it was a bunch of ideas. It was a bunch of ideas. And we took it out to communities to hear, does this resonate? Does it make sense? And I recall sharply, and it has stayed with me. It sits on my shoulder. Somebody from the community saying, it's all well and good. Those are good ideas. But in my community, people don't see human rights in their, in their offering. They see human rights as something that maybe, you know, maybe white people get in courts, it's not something that they experience in their day to day. And so that's a huge challenge to me. And I think it's a challenge that we have to hold really close. How do we begin to change that? How do we begin to, um, work with people to to articulate what human rights in their community needs to look like and what do they want to shape it as because that's where it begins otherwise it can remain just rhetoric and we have to we have to make it lived i couldn't agree more my first meeting this morning um, april 7th is the 30th anniversary of the rwanda genocide mm. a million people in a hundred days murdered and when you think about that, those are staggering numbers, and you think about just the implications, that's like the whole world kind of just watched and waited. Um, it, it shows the importance of the work, the policy work um, that you're doing, and the fact that there's intergenerational collaboration in it, that there's young people actually recognizing, you know what, there is a link, there is an intersectionality between human rights, between poverty, between housing, between all these different lenses and major pervasive social issues that are generational issues. And we have to find ways and means to, to not stand by idly. Like everyone has to find that voice, even though um, sometimes it's challenging. So once again, I, I applaud your candor, your transparency and a deep introspection of your team. So just pull together those ideas and be able to share them and, and drive public policy in a way that censors humanity. And a lot of folks can't do that. They censor systems um, and, and not so much structures or institutions and not so much humanity. So once again, I applaud your leadership. So my next question, do you have a set of key priorities right now in your work that you'd like to share with us? It's exactly what you just said. It's balancing those two priorities because it it is systems, it is that stuff. But a human rights approach says you have to prioritize those whose rights are being violated. Those who are in greatest need is the priority. And so how do we do that in a way that is meaningful, that's not transactional, that's not tokenistic, that's not here, we need you for an hour to do a consultation and see you later. How do we really begin to build human-centered, but, but engage that people are part of the decisions that impact their lives? Because that's, that's the test for me. Are you able to really engage in that decision-making process in a meaningful way? And, and so there's lots of words in there, meaningful. How do you define that? And I think that's the work that's in front of us is really challenging ourselves to say, what does meaningful look like? And, and, and working with people with lived experience of poverty, of housing precarity, of homelessness to say, what does it mean for you? What does it need to look like? And so that's a big priority for us. And we've, in the last year, as our team, we've done a fair amount of, to use your, your, your word, introspection. How are our processes doing that? right down to how do we do our budget? How are we, how are we shaping this so that we really can say we're, we're changing the way that we work to make this a priority. And that's hard work. That's not in a day. That's not just because I, I flip a switch and now we're doing it. Um, it means changing habits. It means changing how we look at things. It's changing how we do a balance sheet. All of that begins to shift. And while we do that, we continue to stay focused on, on the others. And so getting in place the right policies, getting in right in place the right uh, mechanisms that will hold government to account where people can take their claims, where we as a community can hold the city, for example, to account on what's happening around housing, the federal government to account on what's happening around housing. Um, I defer to how I, I default to housing a fair bit because we've done a lot of work in that space, but it's more than just housing. It's also food security, it's income security, it's other elements. But uh, housing, as we all know, is so fundamental. Uh, 
It's fundamental to our, to our mental health. It's fundamental to our family security. It's fundamental to our physical health, our ability to get work, our ability to be creative, our ability to be civically engaged. It enables everything if we have, if we have a place that we can call home. And so, so making sure that there's accountability to, to, to make sure that happens is critical. And so it's some of the, um, the, the stuff of building, building mechanisms and processes, but that's important too, as long as we're centering and privileging the lived experience of people. I couldn't agree more. I had an hour conversation with um, one of our um, elders um, in the community, John Stapleton, um, and he's been doing poverty reduction work forever. And one of the things that um, stood out in the conversation when he, because he, he went to back, back to housing a few times, housing is one of the only things that you, you can't really negotiate. Like when it comes to food security, you can maybe spend a little bit less on the grocery bill. The rent is the rent. <laughs> you know I mean, so when we look at housing, we have an eviction crisis. We have, there's so much. So, so once again, I, I don't fault you at all for going to housing consistently. Like it is such um, an important piece of everyone's mental well being. I'm just a roof over your head, someone to call, somewhere to call home. That that's yeah. essential. You like if if you don't have a house, then where do you put the fridge? You know, so 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 definitely, um, it's essential. Once again, I just appreciate um your leadership in that space. So my my next question is, how do you feel about the future of human rights in the context of Canada or international? Are you optimistic? Are you pessimistic? Are you hopeful? So I'm I'm the glass half full. I'm an optimist. Um, I think that we need to be optimists to keep getting up and working every day because it's heavy work. It's heavy lifting. We're we're pushing uphill. Um, and I think in order to do that with strength, you need to be an optimist. And and so I am. And I'm but I'm not I'm not a um, you know, it's it's not naive optimism. I think we're seeing changes. I don't think they happen overnight. I remember when I started in this role. Uh, my chairman said to me, this is this is a long haul. It's not three years and it's not five years. This is a long haul to make the kinds of changes we want to see. And I I I really focus that to know that the we have to just keep getting up and pushing uphill each day to, to get there. But I see signs. Uh, you know, when we when we started um, there, we didn't even have a national housing strategy. And by 2019, we had a National Housing Strategy Act that recognized housing as a human right as per our commitments under international uh, covenants. That was a breakthrough. Have, have we, the we, the, has, the, has the federal government in Canada lived up to that recognition? Not even close yet, but you start with recognition. Now the hard work of implementation is underway. And then it's the hard work of accountability that then follows from that. But people are referencing the right to housing. Once the federal government did that, the city of Toronto put it in its housing TO 2020-2030 plan, recognizing the right to housing as per the International Covenant and the National Housing Strategy Act. I hear people talk about the right to housing at the Faculty of Architecture. I hear them talking about it. Even the real estate investment trusts recognize that there's, they talk about the right to housing. We don't all agree on what it means or what it looks like yet. That's the work. And so I'm pragmatic. There's work ahead of us. I'm an optimist, but I'm also pragmatic. So we got to do the work and we got to, we got to challenge ourselves. Do we have the right understanding? Are we telling the story the right way? Are we being true to the principles and approaches? And, and does that get, is it getting us closer to where we need to be? Are we continuing to center those in greatest need, those who have lived experience? So I think that that is the work that we have going forward. The city of Toronto has now centered human rights in its poverty reduction strategy. That's another step forward. What's it gonna look like? I don't know, but we'll work on it and we'll roll up our sleeves and hopefully work together to see how we can make that as, as impactful and effective as possible. So it's about, sharing that vision and then building the way to do the work. And it's the way to do the work that is, well, it's work. That's why we call it work. Absolutely. It's daunting work, but I think it's rewarding because systemic transformation sometimes is too incremental, but the fact remains 
we're moving in the right direction around a lot of these issues. And we stand on the shoulders of so many that have consistently moved it up just a bit, a bit. And this is for so many issues from childcare to housing to, so you know, like I, I was talking to one of my colleagues that I won't mention his name. Uh, actually I will, Jean-Marc PFC. And he was talking about 40 years around childcare. He's like, we've been at this for 40 years. Could you imagine if 10 years we gave up? Um, same thing my colleague Peter Frampton says at LEF. So I'm saying there are folks that have been working on certain social issues for decades. Um, David LePage, Vice Social Canada, that little policy from going from cheapest price to best value. Like that's a huge difference in terms of how all three levels of government procure services and how anchor institutions, hospitals, and universities procure services. Just one line, cheapest price to best value. And that's years. And, and it's the same with the Canada Child Benefit. We, Maitri worked for an under, we, we, we funded the Caledon Institute for 25 years. And the big result was the Canada Child Benefit that put money in the pockets of families across the country to help them get food on the table, pay rent, and, and and lift children out of poverty. It's not complete. Not every child is out of poverty, but what a difference that makes. And that's the that's the power of the policy lever where we're able to make that kind of change. But it does, to your point, it doesn't happen overnight. It's it's years in the making, but we stay focused and we keep pushing at it. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Thank you. So my second last question, what is your ultimate goal and what is success look like and feel like to you and your colleagues? It's simple. Everyone in Canada is able to live a life with dignity, that they're out of poverty. And we believe we can get there if we really focus on the systems and processes to ensure the realization of everyone's social and economic rights, all of their human rights. That's absolutely beautiful. Thank you so much. So my last question, do you have any closing thoughts or calls to action for our listeners and our viewers? Be ready. A lot of the work that we do is about getting ready. Windows of opportunity open. And when we're ready with the work you're doing, Victor, the right relationships, the alliances, the partnerships, the facts, the evidence, the ideas, when you're ready with all of that and there's a window of opportunity, then you can make stuff happen. And so getting ready and doing all of this work is critical. I couldn't agree more. I grew up in Scarborough and our slang was born ready. Whenever, whenever, whenever anyone said, are you ready? We'd say born ready. So and that was a colloquial from Scarborough from the, the, the early 90s. So I agree with you completely. We, are, we, we need to be ready and we need to stay born ready. So Elizabeth, I, I so appreciate your leadership, tenacity, and your consistency. Um, and, and then just the way you operate in solidarity. Since the day we've met, you, you've been someone that we can um, call on. But more importantly, you're at this work day in and day out. There's that macro patience around this work, but that's that micro urgency day in, day out. And I applaud your entire governance structure, your board, your team, your volunteers, and all the work that you're doing on behalf of so many. We so appreciate you and thank you for your time today. And as always at Setsi, we close the way we began by giving thanks to the original stewards of the various lands we're on. We give thanks to our ancestors, all those who toiled without compassion or compensation. We give thanks to all our elders and community stalwarts whose shoulders we stand on as we build, share, and learn together for our collective liberation and sovereignty. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Victor.